Welcome back to the Home Lab and I've got another interesting video for you today. What we're going to do is we're going to electrify a 17th century calculating device and I've got a feeling this is something that's never been done before. So you may have seen my video on the Leibniz mechanical calculator that I built a while ago with all its gears and number drums. But what I want to show you today is how I've created a counter unit that can electronically output the calculation that we're asking the Leibniz wheel to do. But just before we start, I want to say a huge thank you again to all of you for watching and of course to PCBWay for sponsoring this video and encouraging me to make lots more. If ever I was going to make one of these projects again, or if you want to make one, um, they would be the ideal partner for making the uh, circuit board for you and doing some of the machining and 3D printing to make the gears, etc. They've got an absolutely excellent website too of projects, so go and have a look at that and see if you get some inspiration for your next project. So just a quick recap, if you remember this calculator was invented by Gottfried Leibniz in about 1670. He was a German polymath who sort of seemed to be brilliant at doing all sorts of different things. And the key part is this stepped gear here, which is a drum that has nine teeth around its circumference, but they're all of different lengths. And if you position a counting wheel in front of that drum in different positions, one full rotation of the drum will pick up how many teeth pass it. So you can select nine, eight, seven, six teeth, etc. And those numbers are then input into a set of calculating and counting gears here, which give you the answer to the maths you want to do. But what we're going to do today is instead pick up the number of teeth that pass during one rotation, not with a counting wheel, but with an electronic counter. So it occurred to me that because I made this rather unusual Leibniz gear that's hollow uh, with very bright white teeth, I could use an optical sensor to reflect off each of the teeth to actually count how many passed when we did one full rotation of the gear. And I could then feed that through to a counter circuit that would output the answer for the calculation that we were doing. So I thought, let's have a go at building that. To get started electrifying this ancient mechanical calculator, I firstly had to build um, a simple counter circuit that would display numbers from 0 to 99. I could have counted up higher, but I thought two digits would do. This was easy enough because um, it was kind of very similar to the one I built, or at least the counter circuit I built for my switch bounce detector. So I went straight to the circuit board construction rather than building a version uh, on breadboard as a test version. I'll show you the circuit diagram in a minute, but as ever, I built this up a bit at a time, testing it as I went along. I know I've probably said this before, but these simple rotating circuit board holders are absolutely fantastic, and I use them all the time when doing soldering. Um, it just makes life on the bench just so much easier. As an aside too, um, it was worth pointing out that when you make digital circuits, it's really important that the pins on the integrated circuits are not left floating. What I mean by that is at an undefined state. In other words, not connected to high or low. You can see here actually how sensitive the circuits were because as I was building it and testing it, I noticed that even having my finger quite close to a pin was enough to cause the counter to count on. Now, I've got no real experience of reflective optic sensors, um, so I bought a couple of them. Um, and, I, you know, you always buy a couple because you think you're going to destroy the one that you've got. So you've got one as a backup. And I wired it up and I tested its action with my oscilloscope. I was quite impressed because it sort of worked very quickly. Um, the device is simple enough. It just uses, as you know, an infrared LED that points in the same direction as the phototransistor and it changes state, in other words, the phototransistor conducts as light is reflected from the LED back into the photosensor. The next stage uh, was to check the optical sensor worked effectively with the Smith trigger. And I'll explain why that was needed uh, when we have a closer look at the circuit diagram. And then 
I tested it by connecting it to the counter circuit. In fact, um, it worked rather better than I even thought it would. So um, these little optical sensors are quite easy little things to set up. Once that was all working, it was back to the bandsaw to cut out a mount for the sensor and so I could move it up and down to different positions on the Leibniz wheel. Not totally happy with what I've done there. It's not very easy to move, but it's enough to demonstrate uh, what we're doing. So the optical sensor can be in the right position for the teeth on the Leibniz gear and also it can send pulses back to the counterboard. Let's have a quick look at our circuit and how it works. So here's the power switching on the whole of the circuit and we'll look first at the little optical sensor. So if you remember, this has an LED that lights up through this current limiting resistor and it's on all the time. It doesn't shine light onto the phototransistor unless that light reflects off one of the teeth from the Leibniz wheel. So if it does reflect off one of the teeth, we want it to count one further. So this transistor currently, if it's in the dark via this resistor, this point is held high and this point is held low and the transistor is not conducting. But if light shines on it, the transistor will conduct and therefore this point will go low. In other words, there's a conduction path here and it will go into this Schmidt trigger. It's an inverting Schmidt trigger and I'll explain how that works in a minute. And if it's inverting, the fact that light has shone on the phototransistor causing it to go low will mean that that pulse will come out of the Schmidt trigger as a high. Now, let's see if I can very quickly explain why you need a Schmidt trigger here. It doesn't have to be an inverter, but the way I've set it up here means that it has to invert the signal. So um, if we didn't have the Schmidt trigger and we just went straight into the counters, as the light level changed, there'd be a value which would cause the uh, counter to change from low to high. And that light level might fluctuate slightly as you turn the Leibniz gear around. So it might go high, low, high, low, high, low, unpredictably. I suppose um, those of you who know a bit about electronics might realise that's kind of a switch bounce, but it's an optical version of it. Now, the Schmidt trigger is really, really clever. What happens is that the level on it, in this case, has to go down, 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 very low before it switches. And then instead of switching back at that low level, the level has to go up beyond it, higher and higher and higher, and then it switches back to its other state. So it, its low state needs to be very low to cause it to switch. And to switch back to the high state, it needs to be very high. So instead of switching at one particular voltage, it switches at two different voltages. So a large change in light level is what's needed for this to change from a low to a high and a high to a low. So in many ways, it looks out for large light level changes. And that's when one gear tooth goes past the optical sensor. So you don't get that effect of flickering light levels or kind of switch bounce causing multiple counts from only one tooth. The next bit is fairly simple. So we've got some counter chips here and these are quite clever, the CD4026. Basically, when you put a clock pulse on it, at high pulse, it counts one, then two, then three, then four, then five. But it codes that suitable for feeding out to a seven segment display. Now, because I wanted this to count up more than naught to nine, I wanted it to carry, we need two of these chips. And here's the one that does one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine. And once it's received its ninth pulse, it will then carry onto this chip and that will click up one to give us our tens. And then this one will continue to count uh, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine and count up again. So this is counting every single tooth and this is counting every tenth. So we've got uh, on my diagram, I've got two seven segment displays here being driven through current limiting resistors. In fact, what I did in the end was I used a single double one and wired that up. So we've got a few extra bits here. We've got the output of the Schmidt trigger, uh, giving the pulses, the positive pulses as the teeth individually go past the optical sensor. And that's point Y. So point Y goes into the counting input of the first counter. So that can go one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine. 
and then we have to carry so we come out into this one to carry. I've got an LED here that's uh, to X and we switch that to high and if this point is high both of these counters reset cause pin 15 of both of them are connected together and you get a flash on the LED or at least the LED stays on for as long as you hold the reset to reset both chips to zero. So in summary, it's really quite easy. We've got an optical sensor that picks up light pulses. We've got a Smith trigger, which makes sure that only large changes in light level, individual teeth, cause pulses to go into a counter chip, which then has a second counter chip that carries to do the tens. And we output all of that on two seven segment displays. Right, let's do some maths now. So, for example, if we want to have five times eight, if you remember, the easy way is to slide the counter wheel, or in this case now, the optical sensor, to the position that's on the Leibniz gear where we're against eight teeth. We'll reset the counter. And if you remember, five times eight is just eight added to itself five times. So we'll do five rotations. So there's one rotation, two rotations, three rotations, four and five rotations. And there we go, five eighths of 40. Now, if you decide you wanna add 12 to this number, the easy way to do that is to do two sixes on top of it. So I'm going to try and move the sensor carefully to the six position. There we go. And so 40 add 12 is 40 plus six plus six. So here we go, six teeth and six teeth. So 40 plus, six, uh, plus 12, that's two sixes, is 52. Now dividing is quite interesting. If we want to divide 30 by seven, what we do is we move the optical sensor to the Leibniz gear position that is seven teeth, reset our counter, and then we sort of work in reverse. Okay, so how many sevens go into 30? Well, let's rotate the wheel. So definitely one seven, two sevens, three sevens, four sevens gets us to 28, and to get to 30, there's another two. So it's four sevens, remainder two. Now, subtraction is quite interesting, and it's not as easy as you think with the setup that I've made because it doesn't count backwards. Uh, but you can still use the nines complement method quite effectively. Remembering, uh, if you might remember it from the last video, that the nines complement of a number is the number that needs to be added to a number to give nine. So, for example, the nines complement of seven is two. You have to add two to seven to get nine. So if you want to do subtraction with this machine, you can use nines complement. So just to revise how we would do the nines complement, and we'll do an example. Mathematically, the nines complement of a subtraction, that's A minus B, is done by taking the nines complement of A and adding it to B. So if A minus B is seven minus four, the nines complement of seven is two, so what we do instead is we add that to four and we get six. But if you remember, that's the nines complement of the answer we want. So reversing that process, what have we got to add to six to uh, get to nine? We need to add three. So the answer is three. So seven minus four is three. So I do hope you enjoyed that video on bringing this 17th century calculate machine right up into the 21st century. And perhaps you revised a little bit of your maths with the nines complement work. Anyway, um, do stay to the end of the video and watch it right to the end because I add a few bits that I've not edited in there. And also I leave a few links at the end to other videos that I think might interest you. Anyway, I'll be making another video very soon and I hope You'll join me then.